From Daily Trust News Center, this is News Hour. Tonight on News Hour, PDP presidential candidate makes campaign to Brno, promises oil exploration and end to insecurity as police denies attack on convoy. Large crowd receive Labour Party presidential candidate Peter Obi in Benue State. Insecurity threatens elections in 10 local government areas in Katsina State. And on the international scene, French President Macron makes official the end of Operation Barkhane in the Sahel. Hello and welcome to Trust News R. I'm Dashan Husseina Usman. And we begin with politics, where People's Democratic Party presidential candidate and former Vice President Atiku Abubakar has promised to reactivate exploration of oil and gas, as well as end insecurity in the Northeast and the country if elected president in 2023. Atiku made this promise during a campaign rally in Meduguri on Wednesday. Beatrice Kuruzi has more. The huge crowd gathered at the Ramat Square of Meduguri Metropolis for the rally. Two governors, former governors and key politicians of the PDP were present at the gathering. The party received over 5,000 defectors from the ruling APC party of Borno State. The campaigners wooed the crowd to support the Atiku and Okoa ticket during the ballot. In southern Nigeria, Going to southwest, the south south, and the south east, we are going to vote at it. I want to show to them that Nigerians are wiser. We cannot afford any more day after the eight years of APC. When he comes into power as president of this country, he will address the issues of insecurity, poverty, unemployment. Another job, his government will get a job for this. Rest assured, the people of Borno, that what is in Nanama is your soul. But PDP, all the women in Borno State, talk to your husbands, talk to your fathers, talk to your brothers, talk to your children. We got information that they spent five billion naira. To disrupt this rally. Our supporters coming across local government were blocked on their way here. We now know that they are afraid of us. By Allah's grace, when we are elected into power, we will do everything to make Borno happy. We will scrap Botma and stop all unnecessary taxes. The People's Democratic Party's presidential candidate Atiku Abubakar said if elected, he promised to fulfill the show of Borno's request of revisiting the oil exploration in Borno State, reactivating the Lake Chad Basin Authority, ending insecurity and restoring stable electric power in the state. He requested that we should make sure the local governments are supplying power or electricity, which we promise we will do so. Again, he requested that we should reactivate the exploration of oil and gas in the Chad Basin, which we promise we are going to do that by the grace of God. The PDP rally is happening across the northeast of the region to seek the support of the electorate ahead of the 2023 elections. <laughs> Meanwhile, police in Brno State have denied the news of attack on the convoy of PDP presidential candidate. A statement signed by police spokesman ASP Kamila Mohammed said the news is not only fake but also false and a mischievous attempt by some unguided people to incite disturbance and distract the people of Brno or the peace of Brno people and Nigeria at large. 
Mohammed said the campaign rally was conducted successfully with adequate security coverage as the presidential candidate and his party were accompanied to the Shehu's palace by the police to pay a cutsy call to Shehu of Borno, Al Haji Abu Bakr ibn Omar Garbay Al Amin Al Kanemi, after which they were escorted as they departed the town. The statement, however, said one and lady Musa Abbas, 32 years old, who attempted to disrupt the convoys along the airport road, was arrested by the police inside a church after a hot chase in an attempt to escape. Police say he is now in custody with a stone as an exhibit. Well, we are now being joined by Beatrice Kuruzzi in Brno State to give us an update on what transpired in the state. Hello, Beatrice. Good evening. Thank you for joining us on News Hour. Now, what can you tell us about the alleged attack on PDP presidential convoy in Maiduguri? Reports say some vehicles were vandalized. Yes. Some vehicles were vandalized, vandalized by some of the talks when the, when the, the presidential candidate went to visit the Shehu's palace, his palace. Immediately when they were leaving the palace, the thugs attacked their convoy and then injured some. All right, uh, Beatrice, we're getting serious feedback from you. Can you turn off your device? Okay. It's off. It's off. All right, go ahead, please. Yes, when they were living in the, the Shehu's palace, the folks... All right, uh, uh, sorry, we have, to, we have to actually cut you off, uh, you know, here. Uh, so sorry about that, but we're getting serious feedback from you. All right, so let's move on. Uh, still in politics, a River State a Governor, Nyesom Wiki, and other three People's Democratic Party governors say the door is still open for reconciliation as crisis rocking the party lingers. The governor made the statement in Bochi after a closed door meeting with Governor Bala Mohammed. Adam Imam has details. Just a day after Governor Bala Mohammed had a meeting with Atiku Abubakar in Abuja, the five governors who have openly refused to campaign for the PDP presidential candidate, stored Bauchi State to meet with the governor. All we are saying for a good fairness and the justice and stuff, in fact, that is the hallmark of what PDP stands for, for a good fairness and what justice. But we have never closed the door, we will not close the door. All we are saying, let the right thing be done. If the right thing is done, you will see how the whole place will be the whole country will know that the election is over. This is the bedrock of the party. This chief as they are saying, we are the bedrock of the party. So we will not close the door for a consideration. Governor Bala Mohammed says he is confronted with challenges of anti-party activities within the PDP, explaining that the meeting the visiting governors discuss issues affecting the party, he expressed hope that the issues will be resolved soon. I'm putting some explanations because the letter I wrote was not only written by me, it was written by the PDP family in Bauchi and the government of Bauchi. And that is why I was there and we discussed extensively. As for the G5 governors, I always talk with them that I'm a G1, but I'm inexorably connected with them. We have always been together and you know it. Uh, when the weekend, when the autumn, and of course, when they have been here several times, and I have gone to them several times. And I think this is some of the takeaways I have as a governor, having friends for life. Benue State Governor Samuel Otom apologized to Nigerians on a comment credited to him, saying he will not vote for any Fulani presidential candidates. PDP National Chairman Ayu Chia Ayu and Director General of the Party Presidential Campaign Council, Sokoto State Governor Aminu Tambual. And other notable party chieftains also visited the governor recently. Adam Imam, Trust TV News, Bauchi. 
presidential candidate of the Labour Party, Peter Obi, has again pledged to rescue the country from the current challenges if elected president come 2023. He stated this at the party's campaign in Mokordi, the Benue state capital. Jimmy Azande reports. Accompanied by his vice presidential candidate, Dati Baba Ahmed, the state witnessed a massive movement of supporters of the party into the capital to welcome and show support for the presidential candidate, his deputy and other candidates of the party across the state. It was a platform for the leaders of the party to state their vision for Nigeria ahead of the 2023 polls. <laughs> The state chairman of the Labour Party, joined by the national chairman, spoke on the credentials of the presidential candidate as a welcome all to Benue. He's the only one speaking the language the good people of this great valley understand. He is the only one, he is the only presidential candidate that has demonstrated capacity, character, competency, consistency. If you buy product when no goods, where can you go parties? Yeah. Our people say, if you buy product when no goods, where can you go do with the products? The governorship candidate of the party in the state, Herman Hembe, said the people expect Peter B to end insecurity as he assumes office, adding that with insecurity addressed, Farmers can go back to their farms. Today is the day that Benue State gets to meet Mr. Peter Obi. If Peter Obi did not come here today, he would still have won Benue State. He has come only for you to get to meet him physically. Is that not so? Yeah. Whether I come or you don't come, you never win. Yeah. Whether I come or you don't come, you never win. Yeah. Yeah. If Peter Obi win, they're going to kill us as well again. If Peter will be win, we go, we, they go drive us to my farm again. No. So Peter will be visit to Benue State is just a formality. It's just to let you people get to see who your president is going to be physically. The rally was attended by supporters of the party known as Obedience from the 23 local government areas of the state. <laughs> The Independent National Electoral Commission said at least 10 local government areas of Katsina State with 242 polling units and 142,261 registered voters might be affected due to insecurity. INEX head of the Department of Electoral Operation in Katsina, Husseini Jafar, said this at a stakeholders meeting in the state. 
Jaffer said the commission sits every month with all the electoral officers of the affected to discuss the prevailing situation with security and other stakeholders. He said the commission is still working to come up with another plan that will enable all eligible voters to exercise their voting rights. Jaffer added that the commission has directed all the electoral officers of the affected local governments to liaise with security agencies, traditional and religious leaders to propose a safer place that will enable the commission to relocate the affected voters to cast their votes. On security, bandits have kidnapped 20 children between the ages of 4 and 10 years in the Kusheki community of Rafi local government area of Niger state. The children abducted include four, female, four males and 16 females. Residents say the children have been in captivity for days and the bandits are demanding 40 million naira as ransom. Residents also say the parents of the children have been in trauma since the abduction, calling on the authorities to assist in rescuing them. The bandits had in the past few weeks returned to operations in Rafi and Magama Axis, as well as Ngeru Tejana Road, putting a fear to the minds of farmers who have just started harvesting their crops. Efforts to get the reaction of Niger state government were unsuccessful as messages sent to the Commissioner for Internal Security and Humanitarian Affairs, Emmanuel Umar, were not replied. Bandits have killed one and abducted two children working on a farm at Teshagiwa in Batagarawa local government area of Katsina State. The bandits met with the children or met the children working on a farm around 12.30 Wednesday afternoon and killed one when he resisted being kidnapped. The bandits are accusing farmers of breaching agreement of paying levy before evacuating their farm produce. The bandits have, however, threatened to kill anybody who attempts to evacuate their farm produce without consulting them. When contacted, the Katsina State Police Public Relations Officer S.P. Gumbo Isa told Trust TV that they're investigating the attack. Still on security, the Inspector General of Police Usman Baba on Wednesday said the force has acquired three high-powered unmanned aerial vehicles for improved armed surveillance operations to checkmate criminal activities in the country. The police chief explained that the newly acquired drones would assist the force in monitoring active crime scenes coordinating response operations and providing armed aerial support to officers on reconnaissance operations. Speaking through the force spokesman, Olumuiwa Dejobi in Abuja, Baba warned criminal elements across the country to stay clear and turn a new leaf, saying that the environment will not be conducive for them as they may meet their Waterloo soonest. He noted that the newly acquired UAVs are rotary wing aircraft capable of flying up to an altitude of 1,000 feet with high operational endurance and capacity of firing at acquired threats and targets from reasonable distances. According to him, the Nigerian police air wing has equally concluded training for operators of the drones in partnership with foreign experts who have been consulted for training and maintenance of the drone. Minister of Agriculture Mohammed Mahmoud Abubakar says there is no food shortage in the country as at present despite the recent floods which devastated most parts of the country. But he does admit that prices of some commodities are high and there's a problem with inflation which is a phenomenon that is playing out worldwide. The minister made the clarification when he spoke with newsmen at State House Abuja after the weekly briefing of the Federal Executive Council on a day the cabinet approved the revised national animal health policy. Kendi Amodu reports. Several factors have contributed to the present state of things where the prices of food items and commodities have risen drastically over the past four months. The country is still reeling from after effects of COVID-19, climate change, the current Russia-Ukraine war, and now things have been compounded by the floods. But the Minister of Agriculture is insisting there is no food shortage yet. One of the things is to make sure, first of all, that there is food in the country, supply and demand. That's why we are making sure that we'll do the dry season farming. 
We know a lot of farmlands have been uh, flooded and we lose some crops from the uh, rainy season. So we want to make up for that. And it's not just the ministry, even the Central Bank, you know, are involved in agricultural production. So we are banking on making sure that we do that. And the president is 100% behind the augmentation of food production, and we will do that. So and just as other countries are tackling the problems based on their peculiarities, Nigeria must tackle its own problems in its own way. Providing input, fertilizer to farmers, that will also reduce cost because if you are getting it at lower cost, you will definitely sell it at that. We will improve production. We will be doing intensive dry season farming. Again, not just the Ministry of Agri, but Central Bank will also be doing. So these are some of the ways that we will do to, and also prevent smuggling out of the country. Further to this, the council approved on Wednesday a revised national animal health policy as part of efforts to tackle the rise of zoonotic diseases, particularly because such diseases coming from animals to infect humans seems to be on the rise. As I mentioned, zoonotic diseases means one that can go from animals to humans. And we know, of course, Ebola is one of them. Uh, the um, COVID, uh, rabies, there are several of them, both viral and bacterial. Also on Wednesday, the Council of Ministers approved the constitution of a Council on National Capital Projects Information System to review ownership of abandoned and uncompleted government buildings across the country. Closely related to this is the go-ahead given by the Cabinet for the creation of a database on the system to track abandoned and uncompleted projects across the country. Minister of State for Budget and National Planning, Clement Agua, who announced this, said the team would be led by the Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning. From State House Abuja, Kenya Mudu, Trust TV News. The presidency has said that scenes of flooding from Bielsa State are deeply saddening and the thoughts of the government are with the victims and those affected by the floods. The presidency, however, notes that calls from some quarters for the resignation of the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development are not appropriate. In a statement on Wednesday, presidential spokesman Gerbashehu stressed that almost Every state in Nigeria has been affected by the floods, adding that the federal government is concerned about what has happened in Bielsa as it is with respect to other states. He added that the government at the center will continue to do more for Bielsa and for all states affected as more resources are made available to agencies handling the food crisis. In another development, Niger Delta Development Commission has commenced repairs to restore vehicular movement on sections cut off by flood on the river stretch on the stretch from rivers through Bielsa to Delta State on the east-west road. Inspecting the restoration works at the failed stretch at Ihuike, Ahoda, East Local Government Area, River State NDDC Acting Managing Director Emmanuel Audu Owaborwa said the intervention was restored or has restored the link between rivers and Bielsa states. The report. The destruction of the section of the road by flood had in the past few days cut off access to some parts of Delta, rivers and Bielsa states. The east-west road for the emergency repairs include Ahoda in River State, Mbayama in Bielsa state and Patani in Delta state. Speaking during an inspection of the restoration work at Ihuiku Community in Ahoda East Local Government Area of River State, the NDDC Acting Managing Director said, though the devastation is massive, he expects impressive progress by the contractors handling the repairs in the shortest possible time in the interest of the people of the Niger Delta region who have endured a lot of pains on account of the flood. It's like a miracle has happened because look at it now we are standing right where there was a huge lake okay they removed the median and the water flow increased and now they are able to assess the site and we can see uh, vehicles passing uh, there is there are about two more sections like this the one at Mbiamo and the one at Patani okay uh, 
hopefully they should finish here in a few days and move down there our idea the whole idea is to allow a continuous thoroughfare for our people the ndc boss while appreciating president muhammadu buhari for his prompt intervention commended the project contractor on the progress of the rehabilitation work so far he said the damage done by flood on the area is severe and huge, but assured that measures to make the road motorable in the shortest possible time would be taken. The fact that we could get up to this point in just a few days, just about three days they moved down here, that means they are actually serious with the job. I'm impressed. On behalf of the people of the Niger Delta region, it's good to have a president who listens, who hears your cry. And this actually is flowing from the fact that the president gave this order. They have been putting a lot of pressure in order to make sure that this road will be motorable. The final, uh, the final construction chain, uh, stages will not be uh, immediately applied now because you know construction and if you see the damages that has been encountered, it will require time to be arranged. But at least, and as per the directives of uh, MD of NDDC and of Honorable Minister and of President, we will try our best in order to make this road motorable as soon as possible. Even as the flood begins to recede in the state, Bielsa residents are still struggling with the losses of lifetime savings of irreplaceable and priceless items washed away by the ravaging floods. Hydropower producing communities in Niger State have tasked the Hydropower Producing Area Development Commission to focus its interventions on key infrastructure empowerment and security to improve their living conditions. These formed part of discussions at the Stakeholders Forum on proposed Hyperdeck Medium Term Strategic Plan 2022 to 2027 held in MENA, Niger State. The report. The five-year strategic plan, according to the Commission, would focus on interventions in key areas of education, health, water and sanitation, and infrastructure, among others. Traditional rulers and community representatives stress the need to empower women and youths, as well as assist in the fight against insecurity that had threatened farming activities in most part of the state. Uh, I have done a lot in my community, in my local community, a lot of development, infrastructure, and uh, so many things in fact of human benefits. And uh, they proved that they are going to do now with time. All I'm calling for help are to do in my community is no more than uh, employment by engaging the youth that are graduating from my community. Relying on the findings of a survey conducted as part of the drafting processes, the Commission said out of the 1,400 hospitals in Niger State, only less than 30% were functional, making the intervention in the health sector critical in the state. The Commission also said out of 924,000 farmers in the state, less than 1% had access to Meriden farm imputes, while the state had only 56 starred roads and 23 functional breaches. The Commission also emphasized the need to create more police posts in communities to checkmate insecurity and other criminal activities. The Managing Director of the Commission, Abubakar Siddiqui Ilwa, said imputes from communities were sought while drafting the plan and assured of full implementation of the document. Two major constraints are for example, by the time we used to be suggested, of course, inadequate fund power in the health sector. For that, the management committee of Hyperdeck is working on a document to be presented to the Governing Council, where each local government member of the commission will have at least 10 of its individual trade, at least at the tertiary and at the primary he said the commission had also completed arrangements while waiting for the state government to fix a date for the commencement of housing projects in some communities that were ravaged by the flood. 
You're still watching News Hour on Trust TV coming up after the break. How traditional weaving is coping amidst low patronage. Do stay with us. This is not a political advert. It's a message to stimulate the innovative and productive transformation of Nigeria's greatest asset, the people, to create a future of shared prosperity. 2023 and beyond, how do we deliver macroeconomic stability and invest in our future? Be one of the key global stakeholders answering these pertinent questions at the 28th Nigerian Economic Summit on the 14th and 15th of November 2022 at the Transcript Hilton Hotel Abuja. Theme. 2023 and beyond, priorities for shared prosperity. Register to attend virtually or in person at www.nesgroup.org forward slash 28. Nigerians, elections are here again. Let us shun violence. Let us play the game according to the rules. Do not be a thug. Say no to violence. Let's rise and defeat violence, crime, and sabotage against the peace of our nation. Nigeria is the only country we have. We must do everything to keep it united. We must avoid any act that promotes hate and disintegration. Say no to separatist movement, terrorism, fake news, hate speech, religious bigotry, and any act that tends to divide us as a nation. Watch out for strange gatherings and suspicious movements. Restrict access to sensitive documents and data, the disclosure of which may damage national security. Educate your staff and family, particularly on measures to safeguard information and report security breaches. Apply relevant legal security guidelines to protect yourself and your neighbors. Due to misinformation and wrong choices, some idle persons resort to vices in their greed to get rich quick. They resort to kidnapping, killings for rituals, and other the heinous crimes. Avoid wrong use of the social media. Before you broadcast that false message, think twice. Ask whether it will promote peace or violence. For safety at home, still be security conscious. Educate your household on safety tips. Report all suspicious movements and persons to the security agencies nearest to you. Be a good citizen. Be patriotic. To pass security information, please call 0813 222 2105 0915 399 or send a mail to dsspr at dss.gov.ng. This message is from the Department of State Services, DSS. Welcome back and thanks for staying with us. You're still watching News Hour on Trust TV. A recap of some of our top stories. We told you that PDP presidential candidate takes campaign to Brno, promises oil exploration and end to insecurity as police denies attack on convoy. We also told you that large crowd received Labour Party presidential candidate Peter Obi in Benway State. Moving to other news, improved welfare for officers and men of the Nigerian police will win the fight against corruption, crime and criminality in the country. This is the submission of Minister of Police Affairs Megarit Ngyai during the 2023 budget defense for his ministry and agencies under it before the National Assembly Joint Committee. The report. The police team, led by the Minister of Police Affairs, Mohamed Digiadi, and the Inspector General of Police, Usman al Khali Baba. The minister gave a breakdown of the total proposed budget for the entire police force operations and agencies under it, which stands at $871,347,212,609 cover. He said despite the huge budget of the police, the police still need more funding to carry out its operations across the country. The summary of the 2023 appropriation is uh, table 3. Uh, the main ministry has total budget of 3 billion 553 million 59,805 naira. Uh, 
the formations and commands, that is for Nigerian Police Force, they are having 805 billion, 580 million, 450,659 naira. Before his submission, the co-chairman of the committee, Senator Hali Rujika, advised the minister to restrict his budget submission to just the 2023 budget to the entire police force and its subsidiaries. Uh, the proceedings today is going to be very simple. We are going to listen to the minister to highlight the subheads of the budget for the uh, press. You know that this is a security-related uh, budget and it's sensitive. When it was his turn, the Minister of Aviation, Hadi Sirika, announced that the country will soon have a functional national carrier. To the Chairman and Honourable Members of this August House, I am highly elated to inform you that the national carrier Nigeria Air is well on its way to be launched soon with a Boeing 737 in its fleet for the domestic operations. In the meantime, House of Representatives Committee on Culture and Tourism has shelved the budget defense of the ministry and all agencies under its purview until an oversight of project executed under the 2022 Appropriation Act. The committee took this stand when it became apparent that none of the agencies that then up for the budget defense on the first allotted day met the criteria set by it. The House of Representatives Committee on Mines and Steel Development has questioned the rationale behind the personnel cost for Ajaokuta Steel Company owing to no or low productivity at the site. The query followed the presentation of the performance of the 2022 and 2023 budget defense of the company before the Committee on Mines and Steel. Some members of the committee raised some key questions on how long Nigeria will continue to play around the industrialization. In his response, the sole administrator of the Ajaokuta Steel Company, Sumaila Abdul Akaba, said the amount spent on personnel for security and maintenance of equipment is justifiable. Recall that the Ejaokuta steel project was conceived as a strategic industry for infrastructural development, technology acquisition, human capacity building, income distribution, regional development and employment generation. The federal government says over 12,000 inmates have been released from various correctional centers across the country within the last six years in line with the policy of prison decongestion. Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, Abubakar Malami, stated this during the 2023 budget defense session. The report. The Minister of Justice and Attorney General of the Federation, Abubakar Malami, while answering questions during the budget defense, said the ministry was able to decongest the prisons across the country through the policy actions in line with the Administration of Criminal Justice Act. Progress have been made in being able to do reforms in the area of uh, prison decontextion in the country. And the accelerated trial of terrorism cases. With your support, the justice sector has been transformed into an avenue for not only for a law enforcement, but indeed for revenue generation through the huge sums of money and assets being recovered by the ministry and other agencies of government and also help to plug leakages in the financial system through elaborate monitoring and compliance mechanisms. That the 2023 budget estimates for the Federal Ministry of Justice and its parastatals agencies as contained in the appropriation bill before the National Assembly is 71 billion, 291 million, and 12,971 Naira only. Kindly note that this total sum is inclusive of the allocations to the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, which is not an agency under the jurisdiction, the oversight jurisdiction of this committee. Also, the statutory transfer to the National Human Rights Commission 
which is an independent statutory body and not one of the agencies under the Federal Ministry of Justice, is included in the sum. Earlier, the chairman of the committee, Senator Okoyemi Bamidele, said the 2023 budget estimate for the Ministry of Justice is in the tune of 71.29 billion naira, where he commended the president for increasing the budgetary provisions of the Council of Legal Education from 2.7 billion naira in 2022 to 10.12 billion naira in the proposed 2023 fiscal year. The federal government has been urged to increase the budgetary allocation for the Ministry of Women Affairs as poor funding and low priority given to women's economic empowerment projects in the 2023 budget estimate will hinder national development. The National Council for Women's Societies made the call after reviewing the downward reduction from 35.749 billion naira in the 2022 budget to 17.1 billion naira for 2023. Trust TV's Aisha Salihu reports. The National Council for Women's Societies, in collaboration with the Partnership for Advancing Women in Economic Development, said the budget reduction would undermine government's commitment towards gender mainstreaming that is intended to put women at the center of the nation's economic development. We need to uh, you know, speak so that they will know that we've been monitoring our budgeting and uh, our activities. If you take the, the 2022 budget as the standpoint of comparison, so both the total uh, ceiling sum uh, comparing 2022 and 23, you see there's a reduction in, in all of the allocations for women's economic empowerment across uh, we implementing MTAs. Describing the reduction in allocation to women economic empowerment from 103 billion naira in 2022 to 58 billion naira in 2023 as grossly inadequate, the president of the NCWS noted that mobilization of Nigerian women to support and elect women in the 2023 general elections will form part of strategies to ensure adequate representation and more budgetary allocation to women's economic empowerment. And we're still on advocating the participation of women in politics and uh, calling on our sisters to support our fellow women. Economically, it's important to um, invest in women's economic empowerment. And, and if we hope to transition to dividend, these are some of the things we need to start looking at as part of the indicators. Uh, women make up about 50% of the population. So if you um, don't focus on that investment, um, I, I, I think it will be a big gap uh, moving forward. While these stakeholders commend the federal government for its numerous women economic empowerment policies, including the National Inclusive Strategy, National Development Plans that recognize the role of women and the various interventions at several ministries, departments and agencies. They expect the National Assembly to ensure an upward review in their location as they review the 2023 budget. Aisha Salihu, Trust TV News, Abuja. Local weaving, otherwise known as Saka, is one of the major occupations of the people of Warawa local government area of Kano State. The century-old tradition, which has been a source of livelihood for many, is being threatened by lack of patronage. In this report, Trust TV correspondent Idris Jibrin visited Warawa and reports on how the locals are benefiting from the trade in the midst of dwindling patronage. His report. Alhassan Maisaka is the head of local weavers in Warawa local government area. Over the years, he has remained regular in weaving traditional clothes, mostly used by traditional rulers across the house land. We inherited this trade from our great-grandparents because no community will exist without three people, the religious leader, goldsmith, and a weaver. Unfortunately, Al Hassan say he is wondering if he can continue with the trade given the current situation. Lack of patronage 
The inadequate capital, among other challenges, seems to be threatening the very survival of local weaving in Warawa. There are a lot of challenges. Things are very expensive now. Materials we used to buy at 1,000 naira now cost almost three to 4,000 naira. So the whole thing is difficult for us. We can't get materials free. These people who are also farmers say the weaving is now done only on occasional basis. Honestly, government has never given us anything. For us, we are not getting any assistance from government. We are just on our own. They are not doing anything to us. We are just managing to see how we can be able to sustain the trade because it's like a tradition to us. There are actually many people who are benefiting from this trade who often take time to teach their children in order to sustain the tradition. But the major problem is the fact that there are no facilities, which means whatever they do here, they say they are doing it on demand. Someone has to come and ask them that I need so, 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 so design, then they design it for them. In the absence of customers, these people will actually be out of business. Idris Jubrin, Trust TV News, Kanu. Thank you, Idris, for that report. Moving on, a federal high court in Abuja has fixed 15th of December 2022 for the hearing of a 100 billion naira suit filed against President Mohamed Buhari over the alleged unlawful removal of Senator Ifanya Ararume as a non-executive chairman of the newly incorporated Nigerian National Petroleum Company. Senator Ararume is claiming the sum from the federal government as damages caused him in the alleged unlawful and unconstitutional way and manner by which he was removed as the NNPC chairman after using his name to incorporate the entity. At the hearing of the suit, Justice Iyang Edem Eko ordered that the Corporate Affairs Commission be joined as a party in the suit in the absence of an objection from Chris Uche, who represented Ararume, and Al Hassan Shraib, who represented President Buhari. Justice Echo subsequently fixed December 15th for further mention in the suit and ordered that the amended originating summons be served on parties before the adjourned date. Let's join Chair Maka Nwafo for more business news. The penalty for flaring gas in Nigeria from January to October this year has hit $341.1 million, according to the National Oil Spill Detection and Response Agency, NOSTRA. The data was acquired via the Nigeria Gas Flare Tracker, GFT, a satellite-based technology created by NOSTRA. According to NOSTRA, the current penalties for gas flaring in Nigeria officially stand at $2 per 100 standard cubic feet. Currently, companies producing more than 10,000 barrels per day pay a fine of $2 per 1,000 standard cubic feet of gas flared, while companies producing less than 10,000 barrels per day pay a fine of $0.50. In 2018, the federal government increased the penalty for gas flaring from 10 naira per 1,000 standard cubic feet to $2 per 1,000 standard cubic feet of gas flared. According to the Nigeria Gas Flare Tracker, from January to October 2022, the flared gas emitted 9.1 million tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, worth $596.9 million. Nigeria's public debt stock rose from 35.46 trillion naira in the second quarter of 2021 to 42.84 trillion naira in the second quarter of 2022. According to the National Bureau of Statistics, NBS, and its Nigerian domestic and foreign debt report for the second quarter of 2021 to quarter two, 2022, released in Abuja on Wednesday, this includes external and domestic debts. The NBS stated that external debt stood at 13.713 trillion naira in the second quarter of 2021 and increased to 16.61 trillion naira in the second quarter of 2022. 
It also stated that domestic debt was 21.75 trillion naira in the second quarter of 2021, but increased to 26.23 trillion naira in the second quarter of 2022. This, it further stated, shows that public debt in national currency grew by 20.81% in the second quarter of 2022 from figures recorded in the second quarter of 2021. And finally, in stocks, transactions on the floor of the exchange on Wednesday closed on a positive note as the all share index grew marginally by 0.04% to close at 43,477.48 points from the previous close of 43,461.60 points. Investors gained 9 billion naira as the market capitalization closed at 23.6813 trillion naira from the previous close of 23.672 trillion naira. The market broke closed positive as 12 equities emerged as gainers against 11 equities that declined in their share prices. An aggregate of 133.4 million units of shares were traded in 3,078 deals valued at 1.81 billion naira. And that's it on Business News. I am Chiamaka Mafo. President Muhammad Buhari on Wednesday met with King Charles III at Buckingham Palace in the United Kingdom. President Buhari left Abuja for London on October 31, 2022 for a routine medical checkup. Although no statement was issued on the meeting between the two leaders, Trust TV learned that issues that will strengthen the existing bilateral relationships were discussed. Both leaders had exchanged communication before Wednesday's meeting. King Charles III had written to President Buhari, sympathizing with him over the devastating floods that have killed hundreds and displaced millions in Nigeria. Moving on to the foreign scene, French President Emmanuel Macron on Wednesday announced the official end of the Barkhane operation in Mali. Macron also said the country's new roadmap on the African continent will be finalized within six months as part of a reorganization of its operations following tensions with the military junta in Bamako. Macron announced in 2021 a profound transformation of the French military presence in the region, which included the end of the Barkhan operation launched in 2014 and the basic pillar of the French strategy in a region marked in a recent years by growing insecurity. Thus, Macron announced that a phase of exchanges will begin with African partners to determine the new status of Paris in the region, as well as the future activity of French missions in Africa. Still on the international scene, eight Nigerian Americans were victorious in the United States midterm elections. In the state of Georgia, Shagun Adeina, Gabi Okoye, Solomon Adesonya, Tish Nagishe, and Phil Olaleye won their legislative seats as state representatives in their districts. Similarly, Carol Kazim won the Pennsylvania state representative in District 159, while Esther Agbaje was re-elected as Minnesota state representative in District 59B. Oye Owolewa was also re-elected to the U.S. House as shadow representative in Washington, D.C. President Muhammad Buhari, who congratulated them on their victories, prayed for a successful tenure in office. He thanks them for their invaluable support and partnership over the years with groups affiliated with the ideals and objectives of Nigerians in diaspora associations in the United States. Right now, Voice of America House, House of Service Chief Aliyu Mustafa Sokoto joins us from Washington, D.C. to discuss the U.S. midterm election. Well, uh, you know, this the outcome of this election is from most results that we have seen so far has been really surprising to say the least because uh, when I went to bed last night the expectation and anticipation was that the Republicans were expecting what they call a red wave. There was no wave this morning at all. The wave was somewhere in the sea and it stayed right there and there were some shocking results and uh, most of the predictions were based on the assumed lack of popularity of the president, President Biden. People thought that because his uh, numbers were low, that his party 
uh, would lose. And let me tell you this, historically, the party in the White House usually loses the midterm elections because this is the halfway uh, through the first term of the president when these elections are held for mostly legislative uh, houses. So it is expected that while the party, in this case the Democrats, are holding on to the White House or the House, and uh, right now the Senate is still a toss up because the results from Georgia is not in yet. There's very likelihood that Georgia will go into a runoff sometimes in December, I think around December 6th. But Democrats did so well in places like Pennsylvania where they picked up a, a Senate seat. And the Republicans will only need one seat, remember that, to take control of the Senate. Hmm. They need five uh, seats in the House of Representatives to, to control the entire National Assembly of the United States. Okay, so how will this shape the 2024 presidential elections? That's another interesting aspect to this election because uh, you have to take uh, former President Trump into uh, consideration before some of this start, uh, results started to emerge, the expectation was that President, former President Trump was going to announce his um, uh, decision to run for election in 2024. In about a week from today, we're no longer sure that that's going to happen because uh, the uh, expectation was always based on how well the Republicans do in the midterm elections. So with the outcome now happening, um, we don't know if that's still going to happen. But uh, President Trump has been indicating a lot of interest in uh, seeking a re-election in 2024. What this does uh, is that it encourages people who were planning to run against Trump. Biden has already also indicated his interest for the encouragement to consider running again because the Democrats did uh, unexpectedly very well. Okay, but how are the Americans reacting to, you know, uh, the election so far, the outcome so far? You know, uh, the outcome of the election were always, was always based on what is happening currently in the United States from the economic point of view. For instance, inflation is one of the most important topics in the minds of uh, most Americans. Things are so expensive right now. Uh, there are also other issues like um, abortion. Uh, you might remember that uh, Roe v. Wade was... Uh, overturned recently by the Supreme Court. And um, women are pretty pissed off about that. And you know, in, in the United States, like in most places, you cannot win an election without women. And uh, I think some of those women expressed their dis, dis, uh, displeasure through the vote that we saw taking place yesterday. So if you look at people like Biden, he would feel encouraged. You look at Trump, he wouldn't be too happy with what happened. All right, that was uh, the chief voice of America House Service, Ali Mustafa Sokoto, joining us earlier live. Uh, he joined us earlier from uh, Washington, D.C. to discuss the U.S. midterm elections. All right, with that, we'll move on to the final story, which is sports. Player 2 United has been knocked out of the CAF Confederation Cup after conceding three goals in the second half of the second leg tie at Al Akhtar of Libya in an away match played in Libya. Plato United had a 4-1 win lead in the first leg played at MQ Abiola Stadium, Abuja. The Libyans advanced to the group stage of CAF Confederation on away goal rule, cut C of three second half goals, having scored a goal in Nigeria to end at 4-4 aggregate. And with this, we've come to the end of Trust News Hour. Don't forget to follow us across all our social media platforms. I'm Dashan Hussein Usman. Thanks for watching.